the practice needs to have genuine intent behind it that is not buy my stuff, hire me now. And I think that's where we, the, the, where follow-up gets broken is people get so focused on, well, I need that client. And so they email and say, hey, have you been thinking about it? Hey, do you want to sign up? Hey, are you ready? Or they, or they um, you know, book another Zoom call. That's another great way to follow up is say, hey, I'd love to catch up with you in a couple of weeks. You want to book another call with me? And when you get on that call and you're like, okay, are you ready to work with me? It's not, it's not a follow-up. That is a sales pitch. And people are so tired of getting sold that they automatically tune it out. So, you know, follow-up techniques, know who you're following up with, know why you're following up, and then figure out the most efficient way to do the follow-up that doesn't take a lot of time and energy on your part, but makes a big impact on their part. Thank you so much for tuning in to Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. I'm your host, Christian D. Evans. And guys, we have someone very special on today because, see, she is known for your follow-up should build relationships. And so what's so interesting about today's world right now, it is about scaling the unscalable. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to have her on today. She is a messaging and frontal specialist and expert working with business owners and entrepreneurs to create messaging and processes that inspire loyalty, momentum, and action that leverages trust, authenticity, and profitability. Ability. She uses her more than 20 years of experience with customer service and marketing to uncover the gaps and messaging that leads to lower conversions and plugs them through customized systems, structures, and processes that are bolstered by copy that converts. Please welcome my guest, Bree Gunn. How are you doing today, Bree? I'm doing great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, hey, I'm really looking forward to having this conversation. But before we jump into it, you know, I I love the, the, the quote, your follow-up should build relationships. Um, kind of tell me a little bit about that and, and why does that resonate with you so much? Well, I think that in the online space, especially since the pandemic, you know, we've re- we, we can't do, or we can now, but we couldn't for so long do those in-person face-to-face, belly-to-belly conversations with people. We had to convert to online and, you know, the follow-up kind of fell on the wayside. I had... I, I, my parents ingrained in me the importance of, you know, sending a thank you card when you do a job interview or, you know, following up with an email or making sure people get their stuff. And as the last two years has gone by, I'm noticing more and more people don't do follow up. And then when I actually do my follow up and I, I do, you know, send an email or phone call or whatever, what have you, people are shocked that someone's actually taking the time and making the effort. And so I, I kind of landed on this this thought that, you know, sales are built on relationships at the core, especially if you're a service-based business, especially if you want return customers, repeat customers, doesn't matter what your industry is. And follow-up shouldn't be to get the sale. Follow-up should be about the human being. And so we need to put the humanity back into our marketing, back into our sales, back into our content because we've gotten so far away from what we would do. You know, we would never walk up to someone at a park and be like, hi, I just met you. Let's get married. That's creepy and weird. And you would run and call the cops period end of story. But in the online space, that has become the norm. Hey, I just met you by my stuff. Hey, I just met you hire me. Why, why should they? The the follow-up is where you build that relationship, where you, where you collate the information that they need to hear about you so they can make an informed decision. So when done right, follow-up is, is really a cash driving practice. Well, I love that because see, so let me ask you this, a follow-up question. Okay. What would be effective way to follow up? Something that's totally different because you have to stand out definitely in the credit. You can't just do an email. You can't be like, hey, I was thinking about you. No, what, what are some effective ways to really say, you know what? I was really, truly wanting to build a relationship. I'm not wanting to try to sell you. What does that look like? So it can be an email. It can be very, very simple, but it's not an email that says, hey, I, I loved our conversation. Have you thought about working with me? It's an email that says, hey, I saw this article that I think you would really like. It could be a card in the actual physical mail if you can get their mailing address. It can be tagging them in a post saying, you know, I had this amazing conversation with Christian the other day 
And he really got me thinking, and, and this is what this is what per, what I produce based on our conversation. Follow-up doesn't have to be cut and dry. Hi, I met you. Here's here's what I'm after. It shouldn't be that way. It should be very fluid. You can follow up with um, one of my clients does something called a wow box where she puts together her print magazine, her marketing materials, a handwritten card, some goodies, and she sends it to them physically. Depending on you have to follow up is important, but you have to know the audience that you're following up with. There are people who will not appreciate a handwritten card. There are people who will not appreciate a phone call. There are people who will not appreciate an invitation to lunch. Those are all techniques you can use, especially if you're local with them or you, or you've gotten to know them a little bit better. You know, as you go deeper in the relationship, you typically are going to have more touch points because you become more accustomed to talking to that person. They they become more of a acquaintance versus a stranger. But if you, if you go after follow-up, whatever avenue you choose, whether it's email or written handwritten notes or tagging on social media, the practice needs to have genuine intent behind it that is not buy my stuff, hire me now. And I think that's where we, the, the, where follow-up gets broken is people get so focused on, well, I need that client. And so they email and say, hey, have you been thinking about it? Hey, do you want to sign up? Hey, are you ready? Or they, or they um, you know, book another Zoom call. That's another great way to follow up is say, hey, I'd love to catch up with you in a couple of weeks. You want to book another call with me? And when you get on that call and you're like, okay, are you ready to work with me? It's not, it's not a follow-up. That is a sales pitch. And people are so tired of getting sold that they automatically tune it out. So, you know, follow-up techniques, know who you're following up with, know why you're following up, and then figure out the most efficient way to do the follow-up that doesn't take a lot of time and energy on your part, but makes a big impact on their part. Well, that's a really good point. So, because see, I think a lot of times as business owners and and just, you know, individuals in the service base, we always want to automate as much as we can in our life, right? And though with automation comes that impersonal touch. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to ask you that. So what would you say is like, you know, something that would be effective, but also doesn't cost or, or cost much time and energy, but is very effective in the long run. I know a lot of people, the LinkedIn strategy, uh, that's huge right now, definitely B2B side of things and, and finding clients and, and acquiring clients. Um, but I, I'd love to kind of get your response in, in regards to kind of like, what, what would be like effective way of saying, hey, you know, like you said, the Zoom, but also like, hey, you know what, this is the structure of it. It's just more of a conversation, but you're also being, um, you know, intentional with that conversation. Right. So, if you start looking at your prospects like people, like human beings, you need to ask yourself the question, what would the next normal thing be that I would do? If I were to meet this person in a coffee shop, what would I do? Would I hand them a business card? Would I get them on my calendar? What would my next natural step be that wouldn't make me look like a crazy weirdo in the park asking someone to marry me? So once you figure that out, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn, but I think people use it wrong. They go in for the follow-up and it's, it's that same, buy my stuff, make a sale. When you flip it, the best follow-up that doesn't take time is templated, but not automated. So you can use your templates to, you know, hey, I know your kids were sick. I hope they're feeling better. How are you hanging in there? Hey, follow up with something that they shared with you on that first meet or in the previous message or you noticed in the, like something that you could, you could latch on to. Maybe they published a post that they got a new puppy. Find a reason to reach out to them and to follow up with them and to see how they're doing and checking on, on the journey. Every follow-up doesn't have to look the same, but it should follow the same cadence. And that is building relationship. The question should be a leading question, open-ended, so that you give them the opportunity to talk about themselves. And oftentimes, you know, we're very polite creatures, human beings. And they'll be like, you know, you're like, hey, what, what are you doing in your business right now? They'll be like, oh, I'm doing this. Well, how about you? And you can ignore that question and follow up with them again. Be like, that sounds fantastic. Tell me more. You know, the phrase tell me more is not used nearly enough. And when we are genuinely interested or appear genuinely interested, people actually want to share and build that, that conversation. And then you can, when it feels natural, you can get them on the next step. Maybe that's a call. Maybe that's an email, maybe, you know, get them to a point, but making sure that you follow up consistently is key. So that, that, that doesn't mean you have to be on social media or in your inbox all day, every day, but making sure that you have those touch points, you respond within a reasonable amount of time, you know, 24 to 48 hours, 
And if they haven't responded back to you, don't let that conversation die. Go back in three or four days or a week and be like, Hey, I'm not sure if this got lost in your inbox. Hey, you know, I I just want to make sure I mailed you this. I I sent this, I tagged you here. Just want to make sure you saw it. You know, put yourself in the position of being helpful instead of being a salesperson. Well, one of the things that I I remember specifically is, um, you know, I was, I was talking to someone and the way they approached was totally different. Um, and, and the messaging, it was my birthday and they said, Hey, happy birthday. Just wanted to say happy birthday, man. I love what you got going on. And I saw that you're, and he asked a question. He said, Hey, I saw that you're an ABC. Right. And, and I said, Oh, that's cool. And I said, Hey, what I'm trying to build my own podcast. I think that's what it was about actually. And, uh, you know, how would you suggest all of a sudden why that was so tremendously different is one he was asking a question he was humble he wanted to learn he wasn't trying to be the expert and then what happened is facilitated conversation and of course i jumped on him uh you know a phone call with him i said hey what, what's going on hey a wonderful whatever and we were having this conversation so I, I just i love what you're saying and now i do love what you're also saying on the front end right so today's world it's all about attention gathering people's attention and because you're you're very small and, and secluded and and you have to really fight against the crowd, all this, all this attention, everybody's, you know, um, uh, your, your, your attention is different, right? Bombarded with all different things. So my, my question though, is psychologically, how do you get into your real deep down customer point of view, like your, your deep psychological, like their needs, their desires. I know that is a lot of psychological in sales, but I'd love to get your response on how to really develop that. Because I think a lot of times we're very elementary. Oh yeah. I know that they, I know that they love, um, you know, ABC, you know, show, and I know they love shark tank and okay. Yeah. But what, what are their true desires? What's, what's that thing that really gets that seven, eight feet deep that really like, wow, you hit it home with me. Well, I mean, first of all, if you're the person that, if you're, if you have been creating an avatar around the shows they like and where they shop, stop it right now. That's a, that's terrible advice. You need to talk to human beings, do your market research, go out there, put up a post, send out an email and ask people to hop on a conversation with you, not hop on a market research call, not pop, not hop on a connection call, have a conversation with you. Hey, I'm looking for five people who are struggling with this. I'd love to ask you a few questions. Be very, very transparent and very, very upfront about what you're looking for. And then treat every connection call you have, every conversation you have as market research. Listen carefully to the words they use, how they phrase them, the order that they put their problems in, because that's gold. That's super valuable information. When you're doing outreach, like you mentioned LinkedIn earlier, it's really, really easy to say, you know, you have this problem. I can help you with that. Instead say, well, how long has that been a problem? You know, that must be really frustrating. I have totally been there. You know, I, I, I had that same problem not too long ago. I'd love if, if you're open to it, I'd love to hop on a call and tell you what I did to fix it. Treat humans like humans. Stop trying to be a sales machine. You're not a sales machine. You're a human being. And all we really want is to be seen. And when you can focus your lens on someone else, and, and really, really get deep about what their pain and desires are. The thing is, when you are going at a conversation for the purposes of market research, it is highly likely that you will sell that person when you do it correctly. You know, you, you use the follow-up to build a relationship, to build trust, to build your expertise, to showcase what you can do, but you're doing it in such a way that it is in service to them instead of in service to yourself. And so I would say that the first thing you need to do, if you, if you, if you've created this avatar that has all these things, no one has ever written a sales page that says, if you shop at Nordstrom and love Dooney and Burke, unless they're trying to sell you a purse, you know, if you're, if, if you are a coach or a consultant or a service provider, none of that matters. What actually matters is this thing is driving me absolutely bonkers. I cannot with this anymore. I need this X, Y, Z thing to stop. This is holding me back in my business. This is holding me back with my life. This is holding me back. Figure out what those pieces of of information are. A great way to do this is actually if you have an email list, which you should, because we don't know social media. And I've, I've talked to so many people who've been shut down for things that were completely bizarre, you know, get people on your email list and then leverage that and send out an email that's very simple that says, you know, hey, Christian, 
I have a quick question for you. What is your biggest frustration on follow-up? Hit reply and let me know. I'd love to hear from you. I am not asking for a dang thing except for your opinion. And people appreciate that. You, I have clients in all walks of life in all types of businesses who use that, that tactic. That kicks off a longer conversation because when you get their response, it's not thanks or don't reply. It's wow. Tell me more about that. It's getting smart about getting deep. It doesn't, you know, when you peel back an onion, it's, it's, yeah, you could chop the top off and, and chop it in half and get to the middle really, really quick. But if you're, if you're physically using your hands and you're not using a tool and you're peeling it back layer by layer, that takes time and pain, tears, you know, it's, it's not easy. Sometimes the lure of easy makes us forget that the time it takes is valuable because it takes anywhere from seven to 11 touches for someone to trust another person. If you short circuit that you risk them not being in a trusting relationship with you, not feeling like you're going to take care of them, not trusting themselves to make a good decision about working with you. So if you slow down the process and you start asking leading questions and you, and you get really, really hyper clear on what they say they want, not what you think they want, what they say they want, and then take a look at your offer in your programs and all of those pieces of, of, of the work that you do and see if they're a good fit. And if they're not, not popular advice, but don't be the person that sells them into a package that might kind of sort of maybe fix the problem. Tell them, listen, I could probably sell you into this if I really wanted to, but I don't think this is a good fit for you. Here's why. And here's my suggestion. Either they're not ready, they're beyond it, or they need someone else. Be the person who is the bigger side of the conversation, who's willing to say, listen, you're not quite ready for this here. Go look, go for, go look at this resource here, or I'm going to send you some, some stuff. Be the person that says, you know, I don't think you need a copywriter right now. I think you need an online business manager. I don't think you need this right now. I think you need this instead. I happen to know someone who'd be a great fit. If you don't know anyone who's a great fit, say, look for, put it, put it up a job posting for this, this, and this, or go look for a coach who serves this, this, and this. Well, I think it's, it's funny that you say that because see, there's so many like those fake applications, right? Where, okay, Hey, apply for this ABC. And then you get on the phone call and it's just a sales phone call. Oh God, and it's yeah. like, Oh yeah. Oh, well, you got to make sure. Why should we hire you? Why should we, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, at the end of the day, if you have 15 G's, 20 G's, hundred G's, whatever the cost of the program is, they're going to accept you. Right. But the, what I love about what you're saying there, Bree, is like, you know, you're just honest with them. Honestly, you know, you're, you're at this point and you, we need to be here and you're just not there. And I just don't think our system is going to be the best. But you just won't get the best return on investment just because you're not there yet. And then all of a sudden there's a respect, but there's also also a desire, right? So they're going to be willing to do whatever it takes to get that. Definitely if you're talking to the right, you know, A player and so forth, which um, I think is, is very, very uh, important. Uh, now, when you're talking about gathering the right data, and I think this is very important because I, I don't, I think sometimes we, you know, being in the marketing industry and a lot of businesses, I see a lot of people that just, they're just like, we want to scale, we want to grow, we want to build. And, and it's all about front end, uh, um, acquiring a customer, right? Acquisition. And what's interesting though, is I'm realizing that you have all this data and you can tweak a few things on the front end and the back end that really make the biggest difference. And I think what you're saying there is, okay, but where are those data points, right? Listen to your customer and obviously having a conversation with the, the existing customers, your, your, um, your successful customers, as well as the ones that you don't want to sit sit down with and really identifying that. Um, so let's kind of talk a little bit about that, really dialing that in, listening to the sales phone calls. So once you have this data, mm-hmm. how do you interpret this data and what's the best way to then deploy it effectively on the front end and then throughout your email and throughout your marketing and social media? What, what, would, what would that look like? One of the easiest ways to deploy the data is to simply add an if then to your sales page, to your pitch, If you're at this point, this is not a good fit for you. Let them weed themselves out at the front end. Don't, like you said, waste time on a sales call when all you wanted was to be their copywriter or their marketing strategist or, you know, their graphic designer. Get very, very clear. Listen, this is not a fit for you if you are at at these specific things. This is a great fit for you if you have these things in place, you know, and, and, the, the biggest mistake people make when they are co- co- when they are collating data like this is that 
we try to paraphrase. And because we want to simplify it, right? We want to make it easy to understand their problem isn't easy for them. It's easy for you because you've come through it or you know how to get past it. For them right now, it's this big, hairy, audacious thing that is in their way, on the path, scary. If you simplify and water down the things they're telling you, if someone says, listen, you know, I'm a copywriter. So if someone, someone comes to me and says, listen, my sales pages aren't converting. I, I, it's not working. I don't know what to do. Um, and I, and I go, okay, well tell me more because that's a great tactic to get them to go deeper because most of the time people will not tell you what's actually bothering them. They tell you the, the, the socially appropriate thing first and you have to dig a little bit to get the actual pain. And they're like, well, I suck as a writer. That's the pain. They think they suck. But if I say you think you suck, it's not the same as saying you, you suck as a writer. Those, the, those two phrases get two, two totally different responses, you know, and, and so making sure as you, you keep track of this information, you actually collect your data, get it in a spreadsheet, get it in Trello, get it in some, I don't care where you keep it, record the conversations, use Otter, use the tools that are, are readily available to us to transcribe and record the audio. Um, I just discovered a new one and I wish I could remember the name of it. But there's one that you can actually bring on a Zoom call with you, and it actually transcribes the call as you are having the call. Um, use use their actual language, even if it's not what you would normally say. You could start it with something like, "Listen, you're saying this to yourself. I'm not good enough. I suck at copywriting." This the, use the actual quotes that they give you. That is the easiest and fastest way for someone to identify, yes, this person can help me or nope, I'm not here yet, or I'm past this. I don't need this. And then you will have far deeper conversations with the people that identify as a yes versus having a bunch of conversations that end up not leading anywhere because you're not taking the time to spend to dig deep on their problem. Now, if you have not done a lot of market research, you've not collected a lot of data, Treat those next sales calls that you have, the next 5, 10, 15, 20, until you get the data as market research calls. Take your sales hat off. I can, I, I mean, I can tell you guys, I have sold $20,000 packages on a market research call. It is completely possible because I was in service and I was not there to sell. We got to the end of the call and she goes, so how do I hire you? What does it look like? Guys, when someone does that, you are doing your job. You are doing the thing that you dreamed of doing in a really, really helpful and authentic and aligned way that people can go, oh yeah, yeah, okay, I'm with you. So yeah, I mean. Yeah, because one of the things that I was consulting for a company and just what you were saying there, Bree, is they were exploding and they were doing all organic and it was unbelievable to see the massive momentum that they were producing. Uh, and they were like a $3 million business and they were, and they were easily going to 10 million very quickly. Uh, but because like you just said, instead of quantity on the front end, it was about quality. And so they would acquire a customer. They would do whatever it took to get that customer, that X result, which is what they wanted to desire. And then guess what? They would of course get referrals, three, five, seven, ten of those, because of course, you know, like, you know, like people hang out and so forth. And so I, I just think that's such a huge, key. But my question to you, Brie, is why industry-wide, why do we focus on those metrics that really don't perform because we want to scale? And the reality, we all miss the bigger picture. And, and that's that's just the reality. What, what do you think that is? I think a lot of it has to do with the marketing gurus that have you know grown their businesses to multiple millions of dollars, and they did it on coattails. They did it because they had a large following on MPV or they had, they worked for someone who's very, very well known and they had, or they sold a business and they either have, have money to invest in ads. They have money to invest in a team or they have family money. Like these are not bootstrapping people. If you are trying to bootstrap your business and build it from the ground up without a lot of resources, without a lot of help you have to get in the sandbox and dig around and get dirty and messy. You know, and I think, I think that these, those so-called self-titled gurus who are out there have, have really done us a disservice because they didn't have messy. And so they've normalized this hundred thousand dollar launch with just these three steps or cliff diving and driving your Lamborghini is normal 
or a rented mansion where I live is normal. Y'all can't see me making air quotes, but I'm making air quotes. Um, that like, I have the utmost respect for people who hustle in their business. I do. And not calling anyone out, but your journey does not match their journey. And you need to find mentors like Christian, like me, who have bootstrapped it, who have made mistakes, who have fallen on their faces, who have a story and a journey. Maybe, maybe you don't look exactly like that, but you want someone who's going in the direction and the trajectory that you are on. If it's a good one, if it's a bad one, find, find a different guru, but you want to find those people who you can emulate. And if you can get on a call with them, start a conversation with them, get in front of them in any, go, go to a conference where they're speaking and literally get in front of them physically. Hi, I'm Bree. I have been following you for X, Y, Z. I've put this, this, and this in place. I know this is weird and awkward and you don't know me, but would you be willing to sit down with me and look at it? You have, we have to stop being afraid to talk to the people that we admire. We have to stop putting people on pedestals because at the end of the day, we're just humans. And so looking at these people who have massive success, you have to look at where they came from too. Everyone has a growth trajectory. You want to find the people who have a growth trajectory that looks kind of like yours. Yeah. I mean, success leaves clues, right? And that's like kind of that, that quote, but I, I love what you're saying. Now, I do want to pivot because this is something that you, you mentioned here. And I think this is really, really um, important for our audience to listen to. I believe that you can replicate yourself, find contracts to help you that are as passionate about you as you are about your business and sell your products consistently instead of having huge cash flow stops and starts. And I know, you know, a lot of our audience, like I said at the beginning of our podcast, is like one point one two million dollar, or you know, kind of businesses, and and those are very small businesses, but they want to scale that ten million, eight figure, and, and beyond. But I think this quote right here is what you say here is so imperative that majority of people, majority of business owners struggle with. And so I love, first of all, kind of what's your story behind this, and then what's what what solution have you found to be able to find those those right people? You know, I think I think it's it's a lot of trial and error. Like, I wish I could be like, it's this simple. You just do this, this, and this, and they magically appear. That's not how life works. You know, my scaling journey has been a lot of stops and starts, a lot of figuring out where I fit. You know, I don't like being a coach. I kind of suck at it. I love consulting. I love copywriting. I love marketing strategy. I love talking to people who have a different path than I have because I love to learn. But, you know, when I'm looking to scale my business, I'm looking for someone who's maybe in the copywriting space or the marketing space, who is not 30, 40 steps ahead, because as every parent will tell you, until you have your own children, you know, 20, 30 years after you were a kid, things don't make sense. You know, you get mad at your parents because of this, this, and this, and then you have children like, oh, that makes so much sense. Like my mom called yesterday and, and I, she's like, how are you? I'm like, both kids are grounded. She's like, oh, okay. You know, and she, but she is so far away from it. I mean, I'm 40 years old. It's been 20 years since I've lived at home. She hasn't had kids in such a long time. So she's trying to give me advice. And I had to stop her and say, mom, this, I appreciate your advice, but it's not helpful. And I think we need to apply the same thing. And I probably should have been nicer and just listened and smiled and nodded, but it's just not in my nature. Um, you know, we need to apply that same tactic to our business conversations and we need to be very transparent about what we're looking to get out of the relationship. And I think this is where most people go wrong. It's saying, Hey, Chris, I, Christian, I really respect you. I've been following your journey for the last three years. It's whoa, like, holy, I don't even know what words to use. Do you have 30 minutes to hop on a call so I can pick your brain? I like, I like, I just, I just want to learn from you. It's finding those people and not everyone's going to say yes. And that is okay. Find the people who are willing to create a cohort or a mastermind. Napoleon Hill said that the five people that are your closest to are your mastermind, right? So who are those five people that you are in constant contact with? If they are not forcing you into growth mode and expansion mode, and questioning some things and saying, you know, you have six services. I don't think you need six. You know, based on my experience, you need two. So what can we get rid of? If they're not asking you hard questions and pushing you to be better, you need to find a better mastermind. 
And I think that's, that's the big mistake that people make is they, they're afraid to reach out to the people that they feel are more successful than them. They're afraid to reach out to the people that they, they put on a pedestal. And yes, there are some absolute jerks out there who are not going to be there for it. And some of us don't have time. There's, there's all kinds of restrictions, but if you know, if you don't ask, you're never going to know the answer. And it's, it's, you know, if you're at that 1.1, 1.5, $2 million mark, and you're trying to get to 10 million, find the person that has scaled to 10 million and follow them, find the people that they have hired and worked with. You know, I have my team that helps me. I happily recommend my fellow copywriters to other people. If I'm not a good fit, find the people that, that work and operate in service to the people that they are around, because they are the ones that when you're in a pinch and a bind and you're not sure what to do are going to be like, listen, let's hop on a 20 minute call and get your head out of this. You know, it's interesting what you're saying there, because see, you know, you're, 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 you're being resourceful, right. And leveraging the network that you have, but in order to leverage the network you have to have, you have to get a network, right. Of high caliber individuals. And just like you're saying on the front end, being relational, that's how you build that, you know, relationships uh, and, and that network. So now when you're talking about replicate yourself, right. Yeah. Um, and, and you could be replicating yourself and duplicating yourself at a higher level, right? You know, CMO, CEO, and, and pulling yourself back from the business. And that's what everybody's goal is, is to, you know, work that four-hour work week. And, and it's very, very achievable if you do it properly. And so my question then is, like, what would be your approach when, a, when someone wants to work with you to, to be able to effectively pull themselves from the day-to-day operations and focus on the bigger vision of the company and where it's going? What does that look like for you? You know, I think it's, like... For those of you who don't know me, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but here's the nitty gritty. I started out life as a virtual assistant, quickly realized I was not happy doing that. So I'm also gifted at copy. Didn't know that's what it was called. I was just a writer. So whenever anyone needed language, I said yes. And that, that quickly built into a six figure business without trying and six, seven figure business has, has drastically exploded, right? I look for people who are where I was halfway to six figures at six figures at half a million. And I look for people who want to learn and want to grow. I have, I have two copywriters on staff right now that are fantastic girls. They're quite young, which is great. They're willing to learn. They're hungry and they take feedback well. And they also push back when I say, I want this. And they're like, actually, I think this would work better. Like I'm standing up, clapping, cheering for them, sending them Starbucks gift cards, being like, thank God for you. You know, because sometimes we get so deep into our own work that we forget what it's like to be on the outside of it. So, you know, if you're a service-based provider and you're terrified that you're never going to be able to replicate yourself, that's not true. I still write a majority of the copy in my business, but I have support now. Because I got myself to where I am, because I worked my tail off to get where I am, because I understand that in order to help more businesses, I need people to do the things I don't like to do. One of the easiest ways to figure out who to hire, this is super simple, grab a pen and paper, y'all, and draw a giant, like, make four boxes on a piece of paper. In those boxes, at the top left, you are going to put things I love to do. You're right. All the tasks you do that you literally jump out of bed. And you're like, I love this so much. And you would never, ever, ever under penalty of death, give it away. The next column on the right-hand side is things you like to do, things you're good at. You're not going to break anything, but if you were forced to hand them off, it would be okay. On the bottom half of the paper on the left-hand side, you're going to write things you don't like to do. And on the right-hand side, on the bottom of that paper, you're going to write down the things that you would rather stab yourself in the eyeball with a fork. And the things you hire first are in the bottom two columns. Work backwards, work from right to left and hire out those pieces that are falling apart in your business that you never look at. If you can't, if you hate managing money, hire an accountant, hire, hire a money person for your business. If you hate writing copy, hire a copywriter. If you hate social media, hire a social media manager, hire out the pieces that you're avoidant about And those people will be invaluable to your growth because once those things that you're avoiding come off your plate, you find you have so much more time than you ever thought possible because the stuff that comes easy to you, the stuff that you really love to do, the stuff that fulfills you is where your focus is. And that's when you get creative and that's when you get good ideas. And that's when you can go, Ooh, 
I bet I could do a mastermind. Ooh, I want to do a live event. Ooh, I want to do this. And you will be shocked at how fast you grow when you start to hire to your blind spots. The other pieces with replication, look at your list and look at the things you're doing that are direct, not descendants, but directly in line with your, your core talent. In my case, copywriting. I hate with a passion writing your nurture copy. It, it, it's not something that brings me joy. I don't like it. Can I do it? I do it really, really well. Should I be doing it? Probably not because I avoid it and I avoid it and I avoid it. I will write it if it's part of a sales funnel. I will write it if it's part of a, of, of something that I like. I love sales copy. I love sales emails. I love sales social posts. Like sales give me all day. When I hired someone to write those nurture pieces, my business literally doubled. Like my revenue doubled within six months. It was insane. So, you know, as you're hiring those replicating pieces, look first to the things that you're avoiding. And one thing I will say, do not hire a salesperson until you are a master at sales yourself. That is one thing that, that I really, really, to my core believe, if you can't sell your services and products and programs yourself, you can't teach anyone else to do it better than you. And you should always hire people smarter than you. Always. Well, you said something very interesting specifically because, see, you said even though you were good at nurture, right, mm -hmm. sequences, you don't like to. And I think that's what is so interesting. You really have to make that differentiation because, see, a lot of business owners, you may be good at that one task, but you should not be doing that task, right? Because the return on investment and the return on your time is just not adequate because, like you said, you you don't enjoy doing it. And so naturally, like you just mentioned, I mean, guess what? You were able to focus your time and energy on the things that you did, and the result was immense, right? So I think that's uh, beautiful. I appreciate you just sharing that. Now, when you're talking about copywriting, okay, uh, it is emotional based, right? Depending upon if it's B2B or B2C. And what I always find very interesting is when I got into it, I started becoming more aware of it as I go through life, as I go through grocery store, as I do whatever, right? And I look at, I like, oh, that's really good copy or that, that, that really kind of stuck out to me. Uh, even when I'm reading emails, I still read emails just because, um, uh, you know, I just, it's, it's, it's intriguing to me what, what got my <laughs> attention. Um, and I'll tell you one, when there was one that still gets my attention and it was, it was forwarded and I, it said a naked picture of me. I was like, what is that? And so I clicked <laughs> open it. And it I was, want to see that email. Well, it was, it was a, it was a, a marketer, Sabri Subi anyways. And he actually had a, a, a picture of him and in, in his, uh, anyways, it, it was funny. But uh, the thing was, is obviously it got my attention. I read his email and now of course I, I got in his, his, his circle. But my point is, is the power of persuasion is remarkable, but it really does start with the copy and the words. And I don't think people really understand the power of it. It's much more than the funnel and the color of the button, but it's also the offer, but it's the way it's written. And there's a lot to it. I'd love to get your response on kind of what you have seen and where the trajectory is going. Yeah. You know, content, first of all, stop thinking about it as copy and think about it as communication. Copy is intimidating. There are professional copywriters out there. And if you're not one of them, it can be incredibly intimidating. So start thinking about communication. One of the best tools I give my clients is, listen, I can't sound like you if you don't know what you sound like. So start leaving yourself voice memos, take notes, take long walks with your phone and, and, a, and a voice recorder app and just have word vomit and just say the things that are in your head that something is going to spark. Okay. The, the thing about communication is it's like, like you said, with that naked email, it caught your attention. I have, I have someone who I follow that I absolutely adore. She's another copywriter and her name is Tarzan K and her email said I was in a cult. I'll stop. I don't care that I have to get on a zoom call in two minutes. I'm reading that whole email cover to cover. Doesn't help that I'm fascinated by the cult mentality. I, I, I'm, I'm a psychology nerd. So anything with psychology fascinates me, but you have to be transparent. Those two emails, the picture of me naked and I was in a cult, they spoke to two different people, but they spoke to the right people at the right time to get them in the program, to get them to do the thing, to reach out and have a conversation. So when you are writing content, when you are communicating, think about how you would normally introduce yourself and create a system. And you can automate this, that introduces you to your audience as well as your philosophy and your ideas in a very natural way. Whether like, I believe that there are different types of content that speak to different people, right? We have different learning styles. There's auditory, visual, kinesthetic, can't do much about the kinesthetic in the virtual space, 
but you can leverage multiple ways. You can send them, send a video. You can send them to a different channel, get creative in your communication and make sure that wherever they find you, you have highly valuable content. Do not for the love of all that is holy, hide your best content because nobody is going to pay you if they think that you have base level knowledge. You have to show them that you have a deep knowledge about what you're talking about. You have to have a deep knowledge about what you're an expert at. And when it comes to communication, I don't believe that you need a 72 step funnel. You need some very simple pieces in your email sequence. They are a welcome email. Hi, you subscribed to my list. You got my freebie. You did the thing. Thanks for doing that. Here's what you can expect from me and set expectations. Be very, very transparent. I email everybody every Thursday. Great. Every Thursday, you're going to get a newsletter from me. Sometimes I'll send a new newsletter on a different day of the week. If there's a special event, like I did one this morning, because I have a live event later tomorrow. And, but for the most part, you're going to hear from me every Thursday. I promise you. And they can, they can, they can take that to the bank. Set expectations with, you know, if you want to hear from me, great. If you don't, don't worry about it. No big deal. The next thing you need to do is you need to deliver value. So now that you've delivered the thing they asked for, you verified they were on to be on your list. Now you need to deliver value before you ever introduce yourself. Here's what I know, dot, dot, dot. Give them some really deep things and give them something they can take action on because people who take action on the first thing you tell them to do are typically going to take action on the next thing you tell them to do, which might be buy my stuff, right? And then the third thing you need to do is introduce yourself. This is where I come from. This is my journey. This is where I've been. I'm a human being just like you. That's it. It does not need to get more complicated than that. Yes, there should be more sales emails if you're selling something. Yes, there should be. But at its core, if you're doing it right, your emails, your communications that you send out, your your Social media posts should all be educational in nature and you should only be selling every, I don't know, even like 20% of the time because you have to remember new people find you every day. And if they find you and all they see is sales, they're going to leave. So couch the sales and really get deep on your knowledge, you know, find the platform that rocks your world. I love TikTok. And I do. I absolutely love TikTok, guys. If you want to go follow me there, go go to town. Um, but I I make sure that every single day I do a talking head video with tips. Today was that that email that I shared earlier. Make sure you provide value. I have one sales video. I have six thousand four hundred followers in some. I have a couple of videos that gone viral. Out of the, I don't even know how many hundreds of videos I've made. I have exactly four sales videos. Four out of hundreds of videos. Now, one of them is currently pinned to the top of my platform because I have a program I'm filling. So if they see that, then they know to reach out and it's, and it works. People are like, but it's not the thing that they see first, right? The thing that they see first is high value. You are in the right place. This is what you're looking for. This is my knowledge base. This is where I go deep for you. And then I ask for the sale. And so don't overcomplicate the thing that should be very, very simple. I love this. I love this. Yeah, you're, you're just a lot of truth problems right there, Brie. And I just appreciate you just dropping those because I think that's very, very important. Uh, and now let me ask you this because I mean, just thank you so much for the amount of immense amount of value that you brought uh, to our audience, understanding the, the importance of copy, understanding the, obviously really replicating, duplicating yourself and, and really living that higher level. Um, now, how can our audience reach out to you to really optimize their, their, uh, their business? You know, there are a couple different ways you can find me. I just told you I'm on TikTok at the Brianna Gun. I'm on Instagram at the Brianna Gun. So if you're on social media, come find me. The other thing, I publish a quarterly magazine called Copyright that has sales tips, copy tips. It's free. You can go to briannagun.com forward slash magazine to get, get your little subscription down. And I will send you the most recent copy and the back issues. And it's not just me. I'm highlighting some of my clients. I'm highlighting, and these are, the rule is you have to provide value. This is not a sales pitch, period, end of story. So if they like what the person has to say in the article, I, I include how to reach out to them. But the magazine 
at its core is intended to be informational and helpful. So if you're, if you're working on your content and you're not sure where to go, you're not sure how to sell, you're kind of stuck in your business, that's a great resource to start with. Awesome, guys. Those links will be in the description below. So make sure you uh, consume our content. Make sure you be part of our community and watch that TikTok stuff. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Bree, um, you know, I, again, I appreciate you being on. Now, is there any last words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our audience before we let you go? Sure. Um, the last thing, guys, is if you hate doing it, stop. Don't do it anymore. Pick something else. Well said. And that is Brie Gunn, guys. That is Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. Remember, be uncommon if you can. Hey, stop. This is Christian D. Evans, host of Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. And I just want to say personally, thank you for listening to our podcast. And, you know, if you love what you're hearing right now, please, you know, like this, share this and, and show some love to our guest and write a review and, you know, share this with your friend, your family, someone that truly needs it. Because at the end of the day, you can make an impact in that person's life by sharing their story with that individual. And again, if you're a new guest, welcome to our community. We're so excited. We're so just honored. And secondly, if you're a returning guest, hey, we appreciate the love. Thank you. Share this with your friend and family. And guys, remember, be uncommon if you can't.